Hey everybody, this is Sarah Kreider. Let's talk about pressers. So, how many times have you guys memorized some version of this table? The thing is that if memorizing this table was the way to go in terms of getting you to understand how to select vasoactive medications, you probably wouldn't be listening to this lecture. And it's not that we can't all figure out how to memorize this information. It's that memorizing this information just doesn't really actually solve our problem in a lot of ways. Why? It's because the complex decisions, the really tricky ones that we need to make about pressors are really just as much about why to start them, when to start them, as which one to start. Memorizing that diagram, as I'm sure you've all discovered, just doesn't really get you there. But what about evidence-based medicine? Isn't there like a nice lovely review about all the different pressors that you can just read and call it a day? I imagine some of you have tried that one as well, and also found that um, to be not quite adequate. And here's the thing about evidence-based medicine. I think with really complicated patients, critically ill patients, when we're talking about complex topics like vent management, like hemodynamic management, there's a problem with the way that we do and think about evidence-based medicine in these patients, which is that most evidence-based medicine, most studies are set up around this idea that there's a winner and a loser. We compare thing A to thing B and thing A is better or worse. Somebody wins, somebody loses. And I think that's probably the wrong question. Really, the question we should be asking is, I have this big toolbox. What makes something a better or worse tool in the patient in front of me? Because it also turns out that patients are different from each other. And the sicker they are, the more variables that they have going wrong, the more different they can be from each other. Patients are complicated. And it would be nice to be able to just ignore that and randomize patients without being really careful and thoughtful about trying to figure out the underlying cause of what's going on with them before randomizing them to a treatment. But it's not that simple. We actually need to accept that there's all kinds of subtypes of shock. And that, as we'll talk about in the shock lecture, it's actually not that simple as being like, the best shock for vasodilatory is this. It is not actually that simple. But at least as importantly, patients are different, but so are providers. Don't forget about operator dependence. It's all so obvious to us that if I take somebody to the OR for appendicitis, that's not gonna go so well. It's operator dependent. I don't do that very well. So why isn't it obvious to us that an intensivist is going to do this better than a primary care doctor who's following an algorithm? Operator dependence matters. And that's not something else we can assess with evidence-based medicine, because we just can't make the algorithms that complicated. I think a really good example of how this is played out is the evidence for pressors in cardiogenic shock. So if you've been following this literature, shall we say all over the place? We first started out with dopamine. Oh, never mind. In 2010, there was the actually dopamine kind of kills people. Maybe we shouldn't be using it. Oops. Then for cardiogenic shock, we were like, okay, so maybe norepi, but dobutamine, but epi, but what? Okay, maybe norepi plus dobutamine is better than epi. Then we were like, okay, maybe just norepi is better than epi. Maybe epi's bad. Then finally, eventually, officially, they were like, yeah, norepi, first line for cardiogenic shock. Took them like 10 years, but we got there eventually after that dopamine study. Then we're like, okay, let's explore some other options. Now, milrinone versus dopamine, maybe milrinone's better. Then maybe milrinone's really better. There were some studies that were like meta-analysis, yes, milrinone's the one to rule them all. And then there were more studies that were like, just kidding, never mind, actually dopamine and milrinone are the same. And then coming full circle most recently, now we're all like, wait, now norepi kills people? So this is where we're at with cardiogenic shock. So if you're just trying to go by the evidence book with cardiogenic shock, I wish you the best of luck. The thing is, it's complicated. Cardiogenic shock is complicated. And so to me, the answer is not memorize a table. The answer is not follow an algorithm. The answer is not read whatever paper happens to be true this week. Unfortunately, I think the only answer is do thinking. Now, when I say that, I actually mean something fairly specific. Because I'm not being like, okay, let's just cross fingers, hope it's a good brain day today, and see what happens. What I mean when I say do thinking 
is that we need to develop an organized problem-solving approach to the issue of management of shock with vasoactives. So that organized approach, you need to answer three questions. And the first is, why am I starting pressors? The second is when to start pressors. And the last one is sometimes the simplest one, which presser to start. So let's begin with why to start pressors. And we need to be very clear that shock is not about hypotension. Shock is about hypoperfusion. So when you're asking yourself, should I be starting a presser? The question is not, is my patient hypotensive? The relevant question is actually, is my patient hypoperfusing? And we have this idea that somehow blood pressure and tissue perfusion are like locked together and that if your patient's blood pressure is good, they must be perfusing their tissues. Turns out that's not necessarily the case. Turns out that our microcirculation, where the magic of tissue perfusion happens, as far as that goes, blood pressure is one variable that determines tissue perfusion, but not the only one. As far as that goes, stay tuned, because in the Reframing Shock lecture, we're going to talk about exactly how that plays out. But for the moment, let's go back to the question of why would you start pressors? And the question really is all about, is my patient hypotensive? No. The question is about, is my patient hypoperfusing? Now, I'm sorry to tell you, there is not a magic number that's going to tell you that. There is no single magic number that tells you whether or not your patient is perfusing. If you're looking for that number, it's not a lactate, it's not a blood pressure, you use those numbers, but unfortunately, you just have to be a doctor and think and look at your patient and think some more. Now, you can look at a bunch of clues. Look at their blood pressure, sure, but also look at their mental status, their work of breathing, their skin exam, their urine output. Yeah, check a lactate, but you can also check your base excess, your bicarb, their renal function. Are they having end organ dysfunction, shock liver? Is their heart getting stressed? And the fingers. Fingers, super helpful for hypoperfusion. They tell you all kinds of nice things. Capillary refill, probably at least as good as lactate. Finger stick glucose. If your systemic sugar is good, but you're not perfusing your fingers, often your finger stick's not so good. And your O2 sat waveform. Often when the nurse calls you to be like, the patient is desatting, what's really happening is their waveform's just not so good. And it turns out there's actually a way to quantify that. There's this useful piece of data hiding in plain sight that can tell you actually a lot about your patient's tissue perfusion. So this is the perfusion index. The bottom line, this is a whole lecture by itself, but the bottom line is that a low perfusion index suggests either that the patient has low cardiac output or that they're super vasoconstricted. Now, the issue with using that number is that there's so much variability in the normal value that it's hard to identify. This is normal. The trend is really much more useful, although that being said, if it's less than like 0.2 or 0.3, that's bad, but generally speaking, a trend is much more useful. But it's just another useful piece of data that you can add to all the others to help you figure out, is my patient hypoperfusing? Because if so, that is when you need to start thinking about, do I need a vasoactive? Now, that brings us to the question of when. When do we start pressors? And often what ends up being the issue here is you end up being in a situation when you're like, do I give another liter of fluid or do I start some pressors? There's a problem with this, which is that we live and work in a system where incentive structures that have nothing to do with the human body encourage fluids over vasopressors. Why? One, you don't have to put in a central line. You don't really anyways, but nobody thinks you do. Two, you don't have to call the ICU. That can be really annoying. And three, if there's any hint the patient may be septic and you don't give them too much fluids, then you get angry emails from administrators. Now note, none of these things have anything to do with medicine. They have everything to do with hospital administrative structures that have nothing to do with your patient. Be aware of that. Now, it's particularly silly because if you actually think about the physiology of fluids versus expressors, it's not obvious that necessarily fluids should always come first, even in distributive shock. So let's look at this physiology for a moment. If you compare a patient's intravascular volume, the volume that's hanging out, versus their filling pressures, because when we talk about preload, we talk about filling pressures, not filling volumes, right? What does that relationship look like? It looks like this. What do those lines mean? Let's pretend we have a water balloon, and that water balloon is currently empty. Let's say that water balloon holds 500 cc's of water. If we put 100 cc's of water in that water balloon, have we changed the pressure in that water balloon? No, we haven't. 
Why? Because we haven't fully inflated it yet, and so the walls are not causing there to be pressurized volume. It's not until we put at least 500 cc's of water in that balloon, we fully inflate it, and now the walls are exerting pressure. They're pressurizing that volume. It's only after that adding further volume will actually increase the pressure. We have a name for this. This part is called the stressed volume. That is the volume that's not pressurized, that's not under pressure, and it doesn't count because it's not actually contributing to the filling pressures of the heart. This part is the stressed volume. The pressurized volume, that's the part that matters. Now, let's say that we have a patient in vasodilatory shock. What's the problem? Yeah, the capillaries are leaky, maybe they're leaking some fluid out, but what's the real problem? They're vasodilated, that's why it's called vasodilatory shock. The problem is that this water balloon, instead of holding 500 cc's, it actually takes 700 cc's now to blow it up. And so now you have to put in 700 cc's of water in that water balloon before you have pressurized volume. All of a sudden, your unstressed volume is 700 cc's rather than 500 cc's, and only after putting in 700 cc's are you gonna get your stressed volume. Now, what's your solution to this? You could just add more fluid for sure. But is your problem that they lost fluid? No, that's not your problem. Your problem is that your water balloon got floppy and it takes more volume to fill it. What else could you do? You could tighten up your water balloon. You could take some pressers and make your water balloon from a 700cc water balloon and shrink it back down to a 500cc water balloon, thereby not giving the patient even a drop of volume, all you're doing is converting some of that stressed volume, some of that unstressed volume back into stressed volume. That's what pressors will do for you. To me, it actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense that we should say volume first, pressors second. Now, there's a balance here, and there's some data here that it seems like it's not causing harm. The exact right moment to start pressors versus fluids, I don't know. But starting them earlier doesn't seem to be causing harm in some of the earlier studies. And even the Clovers trial that ended early, it didn't seem to cause harm. Now, I think there were a lot of issues with that trial that we don't have the time to talk about right now, but it wasn't a patient safety issue. And so again, evidence-based medicine, it doesn't really give us the answer to this question, but we also don't have evidence that it's really causing harm. Now. Let's get to which presser to start. Now, there's really two parts to this. First part is pressers 101. Pressers 101 is as follows. Norepi, not always the best answer, but rarely the wrong answer, the end. Now, you probably wanna hear pressers 201. Now, pressers 201 is a version of this chart, but it's a slightly different version because it's a version that, to me, takes into account the bigger picture and doesn't start with what does each presser do, but rather starts with thinking about how vasoactive use fits into my bigger picture shock mental model. So with that in mind, this is my version of that chart. We're going to break things down into three basic categories. The drugs that cause vasoconstriction, the drugs that cause inotropy and vasoconstriction, and the drugs that cause inotropy and vasodilation. Then we're going to further break it down by mechanism. Some drugs have an adrenergic mechanism, alpha-beta receptors. Some drugs now have a sort of renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system vasopressin kind of mechanism. And then lastly, we have our PD3 inhibitors. So what are these drugs? Our vasoconstrictors are phenylephrine, vasopressin, and angiotensin-2. Our inotropes plus vasoconstrictors are norepi, epi, and dopamine. And our inotropes plus vasodilators are dobutamine and milrinone. Now, I'm not going to go through all the alphas and the betas. You've memorized that before. To me, the point is just knowing that there's different mechanisms. Sometimes it helps me because I'm like, do I need more inotropy, more vasoconstriction? Or maybe this patient's just not responding to an adrenergic mechanism. I need to switch mechanisms. Now, the next thing that usually happens in these graphs, in these charts, in Pressors 201, is there's like a bazillion properties that it goes over. And usually it's this very long footnoted thing that talks about every possible thing about every possible presser. And I don't think like that's necessary because I think a list that's 15 items long doesn't really help you. So instead, I like to think about what's the big picture? And in that big picture of shock, what are the most important things? And in my mind, there's really only two of them. 
The most important things to me, the most important pressor properties are one, what does it do in terms of being arrhythmogenic? And two, what does it do to your pulmonary vascular resistance? Because we all get real focused on the left heart and sometimes just forget the right heart exists, but it's right there. You need it. So with that in mind, let's map these out in terms of their most important properties. So first we're going to start with arrhythmogenicity. So as far as that goes, our drugs that just vasoconstrict, for pretty obvious reasons, don't cause arrhythmias. They're fantastic. We start to get into arrhythmias once we start to get inotropic drugs, right? Now, norepi is not so bad for arrhythmias. Epi is definitely worse. Dopamine, real bad. Dopamine is definitely going to be your most arrhythmogenic presser. In terms of your inotropes but vasodilators, dobutamine, yeah, it's also pretty arrhythmogenic. Not as bad as dopamine, but pretty arrhythmogenic. And milrinone, less so. Milrinone is not as bad. Now, what about your pulmonary pressures? As far as that goes, if we look at this in terms of just our pure vasoconstrictors, phenylephrine as well as angiotensin II increase your pulmonary pressures. They increase your pulmonary vascular resistance. That's in stark contrast to vasopressin. Vasopressin does great things. Vasopressin is good. Vasopressin does not increase your pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, in terms of norepi, it's relatively neutral. At higher doses, you can start getting bigger problems. Epi's a little better because epi has some of that beta 2 to balance out the alpha 1 because norepi doesn't have your beta 2. So epi's a little bit better in terms of your pulmonary pressures. Although that being said, if you have them on a million of epi, you're going to start having some problems. Dopamine, not so good. Now, in terms of your inotrope vasodilators, these are pretty good for pulmonary pressures. Dobutamine is good. Dobutamine actually lowers your pulmonary pressures and milrinone, the lungs love milrinone. So now you can see, if you look at this, why Pressor's 101 is basically norepi's not always the best answer, but rarely the wrong answer, right? It does both inotropy and vasoconstriction. It's not super arrhythmogenic, relatively speaking. It's relatively neutral with the lungs if you don't do high doses. It's a reasonable thing to do if you don't know what else to do. You can also probably see why everybody's always hating on dobutamine, because it doesn't do a whole bunch of things. So now, given this, now, let's bring it full circle to our organized problem-solving approach. So this is how I walk myself through my organized problem-solving approach to vasoactive selection. Step one, what is my patient's underlying shock physiology? What am I treating? Okay, given that physiology, how do I modify it to improve tissue perfusion? And when I think about the factors that I can modify to improve tissue perfusion in these patients, the factors I think about are, do they need more systemic vasoconstriction? Do they need systemic vasodilation? Do they need increased inotropy? Or maybe do they need pulmonary vasodilation? The next thing I then ask myself is, okay, if that's how I want to modify the physiology, what side effects am I really worried about in this patient? What are my top side effect concerns? Is it that I'm really worried they're prone to tachydysrhythmias, they've gone into VTAC, they're already having ectopy? Is it that I'm like, ooh, they're pretty vasoplegic and they may also be septic, I don't know, and I'm worried about that? Is it that I'm worried that increased pulmonary pressures could really be a problem, that they have a history of RV failure or pulmonary hypertension and I'm worried about that? Or am I worried that mesenteric vasoconstriction, maybe vasopressin is not so great because mesenteric vasoconstriction, there may be abdominal compartment syndrome, that's not such a great idea. And then finally, I have to ask myself, what agent or combination of agents will best achieve numbers two to three. So I go back to my chart in my head and I try and figure out which one, but sometimes just one won't do it. Sometimes you need more than one and that's okay. So that's the organized thought approach I go through when I'm trying to figure out how do I pick my presser. We go through this approach where we say, why am I starting pressers? Not to address blood pressure, but to address tissue hyperperfusion. When do I start them? Be thoughtful about what's more important to start first, fluids versus pressors. And then which pressor to start, you go through an organized approach of what's my patient's shock physiology? What do I want to do to modify that shock physiology? What side effects do I need to be mindful of? And then select my best pressor or combination that'll give me those characteristics. Thanks for listening. Hey.